Well, how appropriate is this? On May Day, wearing his blue collar, here's Leo Panitch, political scientist from York University and the author of Renewing Socialism, Transforming Democracy, Strategy, and Imagination. That's yours. Okay, good to see you again, Leo. Nice I to have you here. It's been a good week for your family on this program. We had your wife on last yes, Monday. Yes, it's great. Yeah. Well, you saw the interview with Andrea Horvath. You know mm -hmm. that she's trying to expand the base of the New Democratic Party of Ontario. She says she has no problem saying that she's a socialist. You are one as well. You have no trouble saying that also. Are you currently a member of the Ontario NDP? I am not now, nor have I ever been a member of the NDP. Would you be? No. You won't join them? No. Sounds like you're what I they're looking for. I vote for them. I usually vote for yeah, them. Yeah, but it sounds like you're what they're looking for. No, no, no. They're not looking for me. They're trying to capture the center, uh, or, or indeed the center right. They're trying to be a catch-all party. And, and in your interview, you were encouraging her in that direction. Well, I'm <laughs> encouraging her to say where she felt she wanted the party to go. And I think most conventional wisdom and observers that I've talked to say she wants to move the party more to the left, to be more distinguish distinguishable from the liberals, which I would have thought you would appreciate. Well, I, I do appreciate the fact that you described yourself as a socialist, although you'll notice in the same breath at one point in the interview, she said, you know, I know what capitalism is, I accept there's a market society, there's got to be shareholders, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, what we want is that little boy whose father makes so much money should, you know, have a little bit of guilt about the kids in his school, and they're usually not in the same school, uh, who, whose parents don't make as much money, and we ought to transfer a little bit. And, and that's what presumably uh, she's going to make a case about being a socialist is, which is really running away from it. I think she probably has deeper convictions, and I think she's probably far more anti-capitalist than she's willing to say to you. Um, nevertheless, you know, the way she put it uh, is we'll try to put some band-aids on what is inherently an unequal, uneven, crisis-ridden system. Now, let's not read too much into it. She was trying to give a definition for an eight-year-old, so yeah, I don't that's know. That's true, right? You know, not a, not yeah. a uh, sophisticated university professor. But you know, you're not sold based on what you heard so far. Well, I'm, I'm in many ways impressed. I thought it was a very good interview. Uh, I think the fact that she has roots in the labor movement, that she's proud of her father's association with the trade union, uh, that uh, she's willing to speak in terms of not being in favor of the third way uh, is a very uh, important thing, uh, given that's blown up in the faces of the third wayers. Um, so I think she has a good prospect uh, to be able to win the support of an increasing number of people who got caught up in the market hype of the last 10, 12 years, uh, who got caught up not only in the third way, that is, you know, we can both be humanitarians and be very close with Wall Street, which is really what Blair was about, trying to emulate Clinton's relationship to Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think a lot of people now see through that, see uh, the impossibility of that leading to most people benefiting. Um, and in that context, I think she's going to convert a lot of people who most pollsters think are stuck in a position that you know, they were in in previous elections for 10 years, and then they tend to extrapolate that that's where they'll be over the next 10 years, in the same way that derivatives traders extrapolated that the trends in the market would continue forever. Uh, and the same mistakes can be made by w what we political call, scientists call cephologists, that is, people who study election trends. Very good, cephologists, That's not That's what bad. they're called. Starts yeah. with a P, I think, doesn't That's it? That's right. Uh, I should just, before we leave this issue, are, are you kind of like Groucho Marx on this? You don't want to be a member of a political party that would have you as a member? No, no, I'd no? be very, I'd love to be a member of a political party. I've been looking for one to join all my life. <laughs> you just haven't uh, found it yet. <laughs> Still haven't and, found what you're looking for. And I've even tried to uh, lay the basis for creating one that would be a popular democratic socialist party. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, in some ways the failure of my generation was that we haven't managed to, to, to produce one. More on that in a bit. I do want to do another follow from the interview, though, where she affirms and defends, as you noted, the central role of the working class. And she said, at the end of the day, the struggles that labor fights for resonate with communities across the province. How much more radical do you think the NDP has to be to find favor with people like you? Well, I don't think they need to find favor with people like me. I think she's right, and you were right to be posing it, that they need to find favor with uh, the broad swathe of the population. 
That's who they need to find favor with. Uh, they need to, however, be engaged in a process of education and capacity building mm -hmm. uh, so that people's level of understanding of the way the system works, uh, their positions in it, uh, becomes deeper. The role of a political party is not simply to reflect the constrained parochial attitudes uh, that, that so many people come to politics with in a society which is not very politically literate. Uh, and that especially applies to the working class. You know, those trade unions and parties like the NDP and the old communist parties played an enormously important role in terms of political education. Mm -hmm. My father, who was a working class man, a furrier in Winnipeg, had a grade four or five education. He knew much, much more about politics, the political system, about Robert's rules of order than do my first year students at York University. Hmm. Uh, and that was because he was a member of fraternal organizations, uh, Jewish ones, socialist ones, etc., that were involved uh, in, at the time we didn't have a welfare state, in ensuring that he would have a funeral benefit. He learned how to run meetings there. Hmm. Uh, he learned far more about the history of working people than is now taught in the schools or is ever read in the newspapers. And, and that's missing. He learned far more about how capitalism works as a system. Uh, he would understand where this crisis came from better than most of my first year or even fourth year students. Well, you mentioned capitalism, and one of the words in the title of your book is socialism, and I want to pick up on that because that word, socialism, has, I think it's fair to say, made a bit of a comeback over the past six months. It's yes. not the swear word it used to be, I guess. Oh, I'm in very good company being called a socialist when Obama's being called well, a socialist. Well, you know where I'm going here. This is how you put, <laughs> we've got you on television. On the, you're all over this network. We've got you on Big Ideas this weekend, Saturday and Sunday Indeed, at 4 yeah. p.m., with a lecture you recently gave at Ryerson University in which uh, you talk about Obama and socialism. Let's play a clip of that, and Let's we'll come back that. and talk. Roll tape, please. As the current crisis of capitalism has unfolded, Marxism almost appears to have become the flavor of the month. At the very least, to be criticized for being a Marxist today puts me in excellent company. There was nothing more pleasurable for me during the recent US election campaign than seeing Obama elected, despite the right-wing media calling him a socialist. Most American voters didn't respond with such shock and horror to Obama being called a socialist or even a Marxist. And when the day comes that they don't just shrug their shoulders at indifference at such charges, but actually see this designation as a positive one, we shall have really gotten somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it usually works in U.S. politics when you call somebody a socialist and then everybody gets It didn't work this it time. It didn't work this time. But the irony is you don't even think he is a socialist, do you? Oh, no, he's not a socialist. He's an extremely cautious politician. I think he's a very intelligent one. I think he's trying to do some good things. Uh, but look, Steve. Uh, a whole generation of New Deal Democrats, of social democratic politicians like the leaders of the NDP, uh, took the view in the 1950s and 60s that we had achieved the mixed economy, that labor had overcome its subordinate position vis-a-vis -vis business, that finance had been removed from its predominant position in business, and that the state was no longer beholden to business. They were sure that was true. They proved to be wrong. We can see how ludicrous that is as we look back at that now. And a whole generation believed it. When that system, that Keynesian welfare state, got into crisis by the 1970s, capitalism still produced crises, Along came the Friedmanites and the Republicans and the Reaganites and the Thatcherites and eventually the Blairites, to some extent even Bob Ray. And, Putting and, all of them in the same yeah, camp? Yeah, I would. And they all came to the conclusion Bob that Ray we not... Bob Ray and Thatcher in the same camp? No, well, let me finish. Okay. Uh, you know, that, that part of the problem is that, that workers ask too much of capitalism. Remember Bob Ray's social contract? I do. Uh, that public, the public sector workers too, take too much out of the system. And in some senses, he paved the way for her uh, by virtue of the social contract. Uh, and, and the line then was that what we need was to let markets rip, don't we? Uh, and, and, you know, picking up what the voodoo that's taught in economics departments, that markets tend to equilibrium, uh, people tended to believe this. 
Well, now that too has proven to have not been right. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, quite fundamentally, uh, whether the socialist case, which is that if you're going to have a relatively humane, genuinely democratic, and stable society, don't you have to look for alternatives beyond capitalism? And nobody is today. Well, I'm not sure that's true. I think a lot of people are fed up with the system. They don't have any party political alternatives that offer them this. What Obama is offering them, at best, is a return to, we'll be able to, as we did after the New Deal, right, mm -hmm. uh, produce within capitalism equality and stability. And that's not going to be proved possible. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the greater realist, if you want to put it this way, uh, than Obama, uh, or even than Ignatieff, uh, is the person who sees that you can't square the circle, that capitalism can't be turned into an equitable, harmonious, stable system. I'm so tempted right now to take this interview totally off course and get into a bit of a fight with you over your interpretation of the social contract from how many years ago was this now? 19? 15? Uh, even more. more even more, yeah. yeah. Uh, because Bob Ray would never in a million years say that what he did with the social contract actually led to Mike Harris. He'd say he was trying to spread a little bit of pain so that, you know, well, if everybody he wanted could to gain. Spread, if he wanted to spread the pain, he should have imposed a 5% cut on everybody's income in the province, not on public employees. And would, by doing be, that, it, it laid the grounds for Harris being able to come along and say, the problem is public employees. Interesting interpretation. Okay, but I'm not, uh, you know, we could spend 20 minutes on that, but then I wouldn't get to any of this. So let's get to this. Is what's happening now, in your view, a vindication of the Marxist view of capital economics, capitalist economics? Yes and no. I mean, you know, there are uh, far more uh, classical and orthodox Marxists than I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm not sure that Marx's explanation of the falling rate of profit necessarily applies to understanding this particular crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I don't think it matters that much. I think what Marxism gives us is certain conceptual tools that we can use in a more or less creative way to understand the social relations that produce this type of crisis. Uh, the problems they lead us into. And in terms of what you're asking, why so many people who are exploited, subordinated, marginalized within the system uh, are socially isolated, not capable of coming together to identify their own needs and interests and create political alternatives for them. Those types of conceptual tools, Marxism is very, very, very useful. For. Well, we know that the last, I guess, two years ago, Das Kapital sold 100 copies in a German bookstore. And then last year it sold thousands uh, earlier this year. It's really back. Now, for those people who haven't cracked the cover of that book yet, do you, you want to lay just the key themes on us for what Marx was trying to say in Das Kapital? Oh, my God. Uh, in 25 words or less. Taking you back here, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Poli Sci 101. Well, it begins with a chapter on commodities. Uh, and it asks you to think about how it is that most of our relationships occur through a thing rather than us interacting with one another directly. Mm -hmm. I'm involved in producing a little piece of something, and you buy that little piece of something, and that becomes, in capitalism, in a market society, our main social interaction. Uh, it's it's uh, not a very humane one. Uh, he also tried to show that labor became a commodity in that context for the first time in history, uh, in the sense that uh, in order to put bread on their table, feed their children, reproduce themselves as workers, uh, people had to sell their labor power uh, to someone who had the means of production. And insofar as people had been deprived of their craftsman tools, the land they had worked on, etc., they had no choice. Uh, but to sell their labor power as a commodity. And it could be treated as a commodity. Uh, that is, the person just gets rid of it. We, we see that happening all around us in southern Ontario in the auto industry today. Let me follow up on that. Because yeah. do you think, you know, you say Obama's not a socialist, and you say, you know, I presume you're still in favor of the uh, nationalization of banks and, and um, 
well, we're auto industry, here we go. Do you think, do you think it's happening before your very eyes right now? We see the President of the United States firing the Chairman and CEO of General Motors. Well, ironically, ironically uh, what we see is that Marx's statement that we, capitalism increasingly socializes our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And yet the system remains privately owned is being proven. That is, the state, the governments have no alternative when a privately owned system ends up like this, given how we all are dependent on this socialized production that's privately owned, the government has no alternative but to come in and save it. It's the same, the same is true of central banks acting as lenders of last resort for the banking system. Mm -hmm. Now, in that context, we have to ask ourselves, so why are, they social, why are they privately owned? If the whole society depends on them, what are they doing being undemocratically and unaccountably run by private corporations. Uh, you know, it's, it's an astonishing thing, really. So yes, the government un ends up owning it. It ends up owning it, however, unenthusiastically, hoping to get rid of it as soon as possible. For a profit. Well, maybe or maybe not. Well, the hope is for a profit. No, the hope is for a profit, mm -hmm. but the main point is to save it. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't hold your breath as to whether there's going to be a profit there. Oh. In some cases, there Last are. Last time they bought cases, Chrysler, they turned a profit. That's right, because of SUVs and extremely bad planning on the part of these corporations <laughs> in the light of the climate crisis. They made a profit out of it for a while. No, sure, I, I'm very much in favor of nationalizing the auto industry. It's one of the reasons why I think we have to now nationalize banks, because a private banking system won't put your savings and my savings into saving this industry. They're not lending. Mm -hmm. That's the problem, right? Uh, and why we need a nationalized auto industry, uh, including the whole of the parts industry, hmm. is so we can have a democratic planning process that would convert that industry into ecologically sustainable production. But part of what you get, presumably, I'm going to give you the conventional wisdom here, and you're going to knock it out of the park, presumably, but part of the conventional wisdom here is that bureaucrats, civil servants, uh, political people, right. they don't have the, uh, the wisdom, the expertise, the dynamism that when the private sector is on its best behavior, which admittedly it hasn't been for the past couple of years, uh, it, you know, can produce the things that we need, that, yeah. can, that can keep an economy growing and create jobs for all. I absolutely agree with you that the state doesn't have that, and that's uh, what we have to change. Uh, to say the state doesn't have it is not to say that General Motors had it, right? Sure. Uh, there's loads of bureaucracy in these giant corporations. Mm -hmm. There's enormous Me Tooism. Uh, there are lines of command that look exactly like the Department of Defense. Don't kid yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are giant uh, organizations. Uh, and the notion that they are inherently innovative and entrepreneurial is a myth. Uh, that's not to say that capitalism hasn't been an incredibly dynamic and revolutionary system in many respects. But if we're going to have a democratic society, given the socialization we're speaking of, then we've got to figure out how to take the public sector and turn it from being what I agree is organized in a highly bureaucratic fashion, in one, one that is made up of Me Tooism in many ways, uh, one that is not very democratic in ways internally organized. Mm -hmm. And yes, indeed, try to put the creativity uh, that human beings are capable of uh, into our public institutions. You know, I think that's true of TVO, Steve. Uh, it isn't, you know, the case that Global is a more creative uh, arts institution and, and cultural institution in this country than TVO is. It's absolutely not the case. I hope I don't get sued by Global for saying this. So it, it's not impossible, but I entirely agree with you that as the state is composed now, it can't be that. But you have to remember that one of the reasons it's not that is that the very powerful corporations in the private sector don't want it to be that. I understand, but, but compensation, I think, is important to the people who run these outfits. The Premier of Ontario is running a $100 billion company, and he makes you know $250,000 a year. There's nobody who's going to run a big car company for that. There's nobody who's going to run a big you know, nickel manufacturing well, company for that. Well, not the way it's currently constructed. Right. We, if we need to, of course, change the way we look at the world. Uh, you know, what you do and what I do, uh, presumably we chose to do them as opposed to becoming Bay Street corporate lawyers or what have you, 
uh, we recognize we wouldn't be making that kind of money, uh, but we would have a more creative life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's what most people need to aspire to. It involves changing the ambitions of people in terms of what they want to do with their lives. Is that part of what you mean when you say we've got to break with the logic of capitalist markets? Yes, very largely. Mm -hmm. I think that that's right. Uh, you know, that also involves, to be fair, changing how we understand, all of us understand, what our standard of living ought to be. Because if we're going to have this kind of transformed auto sector, which, which is producing solar panels with the enormous skills of the tool and die makers that are now going to go completely to waste, mm. uh, that who are going to be laid off uh, in these tremendously creative and, and, and innovative uh, parts plants, auto parts plants. You know, those skills and the machinery involved ought to be turned into producing other things. But that means changing, in many ways, what we understand our standard of living to be. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the case if we're going to have more equality in this society. Well, that's going to lead me to politics. And I want to sort of come full circle here to a bit of where we started, which was uh, when you were talking about where is the political vehicle for the people who have the aspirations and the views that you have in society. I want to read you just a little quote from uh, the London Times, Times of London, on where the left is politically. Uh, here we go. The failure of the left to gain from the crisis is not surprising. In post-war history, crises usually push politics to the right. When voters are worried about economics, they tend to heed business opinion and trust politicians with business support. More fundamentally, they tend to realize that welfare and public spending must be financed by middle-income taxpayers, not just the rich. And when middle-class voters are under pressure, they prefer lower taxes to generous benefits for the poor. It is actually in economic booms not recessions, that left-wing parties with redistributive tax policies gain ground. What do you think of that? I'd probably fail it as an answer uh, on an exam. What don't you like about it? Well, it's on, I mean, it, one, is it accurate? Is it accurate? No, it's not accurate. I mean, they are generalizing from what happened in Britain uh, in 1979, and you might say what happened uh, in 1980 in the United States. But let's remember, Carter, at the height of the crisis, was elected in 1976, mm -hmm. right? And uh, Wilson and Callahan, on a, the most radical program that the Labor Party had run on since 1945, were elected in, in 1974, mm -hmm. uh, and again uh, a year later. Uh, so, and that was at the height of the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, moreover, if you'll remember, Mitterrand, with by far the most radical program that any social democratic party had run on, uh, in the whole post-war era, was elected in France uh, in 1980. So the generalization doesn't hold. Uh, moreover, even when Thatcher won, you know, she didn't win by all that much. And until the Falklands War, she was uh, going to lose that election. She was going to lose. Yeah. Moreover, and this is what really matters here, uh, the in the 1970s, in every left-wing party in Europe. And to some extent, this was true here with the waffle uh, in Canada. Uh, there were people saying, unless we go beyond the welfare state reforms, which are indeed getting in the way of the market uh, in many ways. They're causing a fiscal crisis in the state. Workers who are fully employed are not afraid of getting laid off. So they're making very high wage demands or telling managers who are telling them to work harder, I can pick up a job down the street, mm -hmm. right? And causing productivity problems. Uh, they were saying, unless we go beyond those reforms to actually take the banks and central industries into the public domain, democratize them, and subject them to a different set of criteria, we are going to lose the old reforms. Tony Benn re represented this as in, in Britain in particular. And at the time that the Labour government accepted the IMF's first structural adjustment program, the time of its loan to Britain during the crisis. The same convention where Callahan came with that, the Labour Party passed a resolution calling for the nationalization of the five leading banks in Britain, the seven insurance companies. Hmm. That was uh, passed by the convention. Of course, not, the government did nothing about it. Uh, and then they ran away for it from, from it for the next 20 years. This was true in other countries as well, in Sweden, uh, in, in Greece, in Germany, and so on. They treated it as old-fashioned. Right? This is Neanderthal. Tony Benn was right, not wrong. That left of the Labour Party, that the media played an enormous role in getting the Labour Party leadership to distance themselves from. Mm -hmm. Aren't these old-fashioned, right? 
aren't these, isn't this old labor? Aren't we beyond the days when we can possibly conceive of treating the economy as something we can democratize? Well, they turned to Thatcher. They turned to the type of democracy that was a, a democracy with illusions that everyone could be a shareholder. And look where it's ended up. But if the logic of your position is such, parties always go where the votes are, right? And if there are more and more people who oh, are presumably no, no. waking up to your... Mrs. Thatcher didn't go where the votes were. Mrs. Thatcher was a remarkable politician, so was Reagan, because he changed how voters saw the world. That's what Ben was so good at as well. It isn't only people on the right who are capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. Tommy Douglas did it. I mean, do you think that most Saskatchewan farmers uh, were always of the view that hospital insurance and health insurance was a good thing and doctors wouldn't become bureaucrats mm -hmm. and they'd get lousy health care? No, he moved It the involves the type of politician yeah. who is capable of giving people the capacity to think in a different way. Mm -hmm. And if I, to go back to Bob Ray, what I would say most critically about him is not the social contract. But when they ran into the problems they did in the very severe recession, which the whole world experienced in the early 90s, he didn't go on television and say, look, the reason I can't run an $18 billion deficit, which is nothing compared to now, right, is that the New York bond traders will downgrade the value of Ontario bonds. Most Ontarians don't know that. They don't know that that's what determines government economic policy. Mm -hmm. If he had gone on television and explained that to people, we might have a higher level of political literacy in this. He went problem. on television, but I don't think he said that. You're quite said right. That. I got a, it, This has been great. We only got a minute left here, and this is a big question for a minute. So, sorry. Your belief in socialism is based on the idea that real equality is a supreme value. What if relative equality is enough for most of us, and we don't need to live in a perfectly just society? I don't think we will ever have a perfectly just society since I don't think that human beings uh, are anything but different in their you know, enormous range, I don't want equality in the sense of sameness. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that we can express our differences most richly when we aren't scrambling to make sure that we and our children get a chunk of the pie while everybody else lives on the crumbs. Not because we're bad people, not because we're immoral, but because we know that it is a egotistical, competitive society. Uh, so, you know, it's not equality in the sense of sameness I want. It's, I rather think that human beings are capable of, and we see it in many aspects of our lives now, are capable of generosity, reciprocity, uh, not charity. And I'd like to organize, I'd like us to be able to organize, it's a very difficult thing to do, a social order that allows us to express our differences and our creativity in a way that doesn't involve some earning billions and some, and some earning, nothing. earning yeah. nothing. Leo Panich, we thank you for sharing May Day with us. Great to be here, Steve. Great to have you here. Thanks, Thanks for so much. doing this.